All right, everybody, welcome to Run Talk number four on Monday, April the 18th. First of all, I just want to say hi to everybody who's joining us for our fourth virtual run talk. And for those of you who don't know, these actually started off as a monthly event that we did with our partners at Big Rock Brewery here in Calgary. I still plug for Big Rock Brewery. Um, and then when things sort of shifted into our new normal, we shifted into this virtual format. So today we have some awesome uh, guests joining us. And I know that we have members in our audience who are joining us from uh, Toronto and Edmonton. So it's really cool that we're starting to go national. Last week we had the uh, balcony marathon guy from France who joined us on the talk. So lots of really, really cool speakers uh, lined up for you guys today. And I think that we have a wonderful talk for you guys, um, a wonderful talk for you guys planned today. <clears throat> um, so crack a cold one and enjoy the talk. This afternoon we have Tyler Richard from Saucony. Uh, Tyler was a former former or one of the OG YOC run crew pacers who, worked for, who works for Saucony and Tyler's going to be talking to us about shoe technology and finding the right pair of shoes for the type of running that you're into or where you're at in your running career. We also have coach Cal Zariski who just finished a three hour run um, and he's the coach for critical speed coaching and he won his ninth world X Terra title last year putting him pretty close to the uh, that big 1-0 mark. Um, so Cal's been, Coach Cal's been coaching professionally for over 30 years, and he has a roster that's included Olympic athletes, Pan American champions, and multiple world age group triathlon champions. And then we have Rachel McIntosh, who's an instructor at Crush Camp, and Rachel's a retired, a retired Canadian national track and field athlete and marketing coordinator for Ingenation. Um, Rachel's really interesting. It's really nice to have her because she's, uh, progressed from being an elite um, track and field athlete into long distance running. So she's going to offer some us some very unique perspectives on what that transition has been like. And right now I'm going to put into the chat um, everyone's Instagram handles in case you guys would like to follow them if you aren't already. Um, and before we actually, first of all, I'll just welcome you guys. Um, Coach Cal, how's it going? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. I'm uh, again, showered up, dried off. I'm sitting here in my underwear though. So <laughs> yeah. It's COVID. It's no pants, no pants party every day. It's all good. No, I, I'm well. And it was, uh, we were talking that uh, finally we got to see sunshine today. So three hours in the sun, just exploring through our trails in Calgary. It was great. I had a great afternoon. Fantastic. Tyler, how's it going? Cowboy. Pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got a, I had a few hats planned for this because I change hats a lot. Um, but uh no, things are good. It's uh, I miss Calgary. I miss uh, I miss my run crew out there. It's it has not been the same. Even though I've got my Toronto run crew that I hang out with, it's uh, it is a different friend group out there. So it's uh, I miss that city and it, it was it was home. So thanks for having me. It's good to have you. And Rachel, you just came back from a run too. How's it going? I did. As you can tell by my soaking wet hair, I'm sorry, but when it's this nice, I will go out and run. And when I started doing run crew, I told you guys, you will only see me from May till like October and then I disappear in the winter. But you guys have actually made me love running enough that I've been out in like minus six recently. So Ooh. look That's at me. <laughs> mission accomplished. Now I'm qualified enough to be on the panel because I run in below zero temperatures. <laughs> there we go. Canadian run panel. You made it. I'm a runner now. <laughs> Awesome. Well, welcome, guys. It's, uh, it's fantastic to have you guys. Um, we're going to go through some really quick announcements here for everybody, and then we're going to dig right into it. Um, the first one, actually, I'm going to put some links here as well for everybody. Uh, the first of the links here is there's a whole bunch of really cool digital events, events going on, uh, one of which is the Lululemon Move with Lululemon Strava Challenge. So they're encouraging everybody to move 20 minutes a day, five, five days a week. Um, and that's that top link there as well. And then a couple of weeks ago, we also had Blaine Penny come on and talk about the Novid 20 run. So Blaine and Mito Canada have created the Novid 20 virtual run, which is a global virtual running challenge, also using Strava to engage, unite, and inspire our running community to stay motivated, keep fit, and accelerate research for COVID-19. So what they're actually doing is all the money raised from that initiative is going towards um, research for COVID-19. And then we also have the Anti-Social Run Club, Jeff Shikazi and, uh, and Coach Katie have also created the Anti-Social Run Club, which is some cool, a cool training plan for a 10K virtual race, which will take place in May, I believe, or the end of April. Check the details at 
instagram.com backslash the anti-social run club. Also coming this Wednesday on YOC Run Crew, we'll have Jess O'Connell doing an Instagram takeover and she'll also be joining us on the panel next Monday. And I'll do another quick little plug here for Big Rock Beer. Big Rock Beer does bl deliver and they've been our kind, wonderful partners for the past uh, few months. So I'd be remiss if I didn't plug them as well. And finally, if you're enjoying the content that we have here and want to see more cool guests and digital activations, I've included a Zoom link there at the bottom of those links. Right now we're using Zoom lines that are borrowed from our generous partners, but we'd love to use some of the funds uh, to create our own digital infrastructure and maybe bring you some more cool content here and on shutuplegs.org. So no need to contribute, no minimum amount. Um, just if you love what we're doing and want to pitch a dollar or two our way, uh, that's how you could do it. So, uh, with all that aside, um, I'll just kind of do a really quick round table, just kind of break the ice here. Um, first of all, what was the highlight of my panelists weekend? And if we were all able to go outside tomorrow and run or do whatever race we wanted to, what would that one be? Um, I'll do in the reverse order. So Rachel, I'm going to put you in the hot seat first. Oh my gosh, put me in the hot seat. Um, it is really hard for me to pick a highlight of my weekend of my week because I'm thriving right now. I'm loving just all the time by myself. I'm loving being home. I'm loving not working. I hate to admit that, but like, um, just really found the silver lining in all of this and I'm really happy. So, um, I can't find a highlight every day. It's just great. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm really stubborn and we'll learn that throughout this, but I just want to like see how far I can run. And so over the last like month and a half, I've upped my distance quite a bit. And so just next chance to get out in the sunshine and go a little further than last time. Cool. I like that. That's, that's a good answer. It's like <laughs> friendly, <laughs> not as friendly, go whatever, do whatever attitude. So I like that. Tyler, now you're up in the YSC run shirt. Love it. <laughs> how was, what was your highlight and where would you go? Um, so my highlight of my weekend was probably I watched the first four Alien movies um, this weekend. <laughs> I got real active, um, but I hadn't watched them straight through like day after day after day kind of thing. And so I took advantage of not leaving home and um, basically an extra day, a long weekend and watched all four Aliens. So that was probably the highlight, but where I went... Um, I was taking my dog as I, since we've had more time, uh, I took my dog on like a two and a half hour walk to like a completely different off leash dog park. Um, so for me, that's another little highlight is, you know, it's just him and I every day. So that's what we do. I love it. Simple things. That's where we got to find beauty in the simple things. Yep. Coach Cal, how about you? Uh, well, this weekend was, was a typical Easter so-called lineup for myself and some of my athletes. We always do an Easter camp, an endurance camp. So we kicked it off with Good Friday. We did a two-hour Zoom bike swim conditioning workout. So that was fun. It went from 9 till 11 or 11.30 by the time we wrapped it up. And then Saturday, we all sort of were supposed to go out and do a longer kind of run. I did 30 kilometers and... Um, that kind of beat me up. And then Sunday, we did another three hour Zoom brick, which is again, mostly cycling, but some conditioning work. And then today was the final uh, push, which was again, another three hour run hike. So that was my weekend, uh, full of fun, good stuff, uh, trying to be outdoors as much as possible. But of course, I've got lots of triathletes that are uh, walking around with their heads cut off, not even sure what they're doing with their with their lives right now. So we're trying to give them structure. And then uh, what I'm looking forward to, you know, I really miss the mountains at this point in time. I mean, I, I know it's sort of winter feeling like that, but we do a tremendous amount of vertical snowshoeing in the winter, and I really miss that. I miss getting out to nature and doing some big peaks and standing on the top of, say, Lookout Mountain at Sunshine Ski Resort and just looking around and amazement of the beauty that we can see. Uh, so that's what I've been missing the most, but needless to say, we make the best of what we've got. Yeah, and I think that's that's what we got to do. I think you raise a good point there. You know, I think we're all being really responsible to, about observing the physical distancing. But when you tell a bunch of people who live near the mountains so they can go to the mountains that they can't go, it's it's a tough pill to swallow. So, but it's it's good to hear that we're all being that you know responsible. And the sooner uh, the better we can follow those protocols, the sooner we're going to be back out there. So love that. Um. 
Well, let's dig into it. So uh, first, the first person I have kind of focused on is Rachel, because Rachel, I want you to kind of set the stage for us because you have a really interesting progression uh, because you have a history as an elite track and field athlete competing at like the highest level. And it was only just recently that you kind of got into that longer distance stuff. And we were at an activation, I think it was a year or two ago. And I was just like, mind blown to find out like your your longest distance run like what was it like like a kilometer <laughs> a kilometer this is just crazy to me because you spent so much time on the track like yeah um explain like tell us tell us about your history as a track and field athlete um so i was a heptathlete which i think i need to explain for most people because it's a very unfamiliar event um to most so we did hurdles high jump shot put 200 long jump javelin and the 800 so we did everything more or less. We were like the ones that were good at everything, but great at nothing besides the heptathlon, I guess. Um, so that was my specialty as a track and field athlete. So the farthest distance we had to run was 800 meters. And our coach always believed, you know, there's only so many hours in a day that you can spend training. And we had so many that were so specifically, um, they had to be timed perfectly or measured perfectly. So we worked really tightly on um, like our long jump mark and a high jump mark that we just never spent time on like our running and endurance. Our coach just said, when it comes to the 800, you're going to be fit. So you just have to be courageous. And so um, we always started our practice with a really hard 400 or 500. And through the course of the year, the farthest I would ever run is 600 meters unless I was competing. So I never once for my training ran over a kilometer which is just like so unusual to some people to be like a middle distance runner and never having like ran miles. But um, I think it was just a really unique perspective to be like, you're really fit, you're really strong and you just need to be the bravest one out there if you're going to run fast. So um, I kind of love that about my coach because that's why now I think I'm actually like transitioning pretty well into this like how far can I push myself? Like, just because I didn't train for it doesn't mean I can't step out the door and do it. Like, um, so it's been really good to have that mindset trying to transition into longer distances. Yeah, but that's super cool. And like, what was, I mean, I guess as an elite athlete, you're probably training like 15, 20, 30 hours a week or what did that Yeah, look? I mean, because a lot of it was so specific, there's a word I'm trying to find and I just, obviously it's not there, but it was just um, narrowing in on those skills so specifically that we would only spend like two hours a day, Monday through Friday. So we didn't really train. Um, obviously, like a lot of your training is the mobility and the yoga and the physio and like you do a lot of training that's not on the track, but um, we just did two hours every morning, Monday through Friday. And that was more or less like how we became masters of our sports fantastic and so what was what's that transition been like because you know we've had a lot of people we had last week we had gill on um oh, cool. you know, who run who actually does run in the summertime yeah. but uh you know it's really interesting to have the perspective of somebody who doesn't have that background of like like a jess o'connor or like a trev hoffbauer who just like you know when they tell us their stats around how much they they run it just blows everybody's minds <laughs> but like what was that transition like going from, you know, the shorter distance, like really focused on power over to, you know, 5k and 10k and 15k? <laughs> um, to be completely honest, I, it wasn't like something I actively thought about or tried to do. It just organically happened. Um, in 2018, I retired. So July, 2018, I stopped running track. When I was a track athlete, that was the only thing I did. I was one of those like and I shouldn't roll my eyes. It, I was so focused on what I did. I didn't do anything else. So when my friends wanted to go for a jog, I was like, no, my training schedule is this. I don't do more than my coach tells me to. I don't do less than my coach tells me to. So, um, as soon as I retired, I was like, I guess I can start saying yes to things. So, um, that November, I think it was in October and November is the event you were talking about in 2018. And I had to run 5k <laughs> with Lululemon. And, um, I actually met Emily as well from crush camp there that day. And it was my first ever 5k. And then I have this journal that I write in. I write, I write one line every day for five years. So I can look back at like April 13th last year and see what I was doing. And just on April, I think it was like 9th or 10th, I did my first ever YYC run crew. And I was so excited. I ran seven kilometers for the first time. And that was one year ago this week, which is just like so crazy to like think about. It, it wasn't even a year ago now. I've just been running for the, like one year. <laughs> um, circle, And now you're on the panel. 
And you know what the crazy thing is? It was with Gilmore. And so it was so cool to hear you be like, oh, Gilmore was on last week. I did my first ever run with Gilmore um, one year ago. So um, since then, I think coming into this talk, I thought about like, what's useful for people to hear me say? And what I needed was I needed people at first. I needed a reason to run and I needed encouragement to run. So I think if I would have gone out that day without Gilmore, I wouldn't have run seven kilometers, but because I had him and I met Scott that day, it was like, I had people to keep me going kind of thing. So I was like, all right, there's that. You can do it. And since then I've progressed from a, you can do it to a, let's see how far you can do it. And that is where I'm kind of thriving on my own as an individual athlete. I like the challenge of, I'm going to go at my pace today and I'm just going to rip out the door. And last week I was like, I'm going to run 15 K. And I just like, never in my life, just put on my shoes and went and ran 15 K. I was like, all right, what am I going to do next? So I think the transition was like really nice because I had friends to do it with. I had a community and now I'm getting a little bit back into that mindset of an athlete being like, all right, what can I do with this? <laughs> it, it's, it is so important because I think that like one of the really cool things that we have um, with YRC Run Crew, and I, I'm sure even Coach Cal, you can even speak to this, but like, you know, when you have that community, it, it kind of keeps you accountable and it just changes sort of your perspective on things because there's always somebody else. And I find anyways, like when I'm running with a group, I kind of find that like, you know, the numbers or like the pain or, you know, whatever kind of just like melts away and all of a sudden you're just like running with other people. So that's, that's something I think that's really cool and really special. Um, I also found Gil was quite charming and he'd get me to run when I didn't want to run too. So yeah. <laughs> he was the only familiar face when I showed up, I was like, I've seen him at the oval before. So <laughs> he was my, I made him run with me. I think <laughs> Gil's ear, ears must be burning off to send him a link. To this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so what was it? Like, are there things that you can, that you can take from, first of all, I loved what you said about, about your journal, because I think that keeping a record, you know, of being able to see how far you've progressed is so important. I kind of use Strava in that way, but it's just numbers. It's not telling me how I felt or what was going through my mind. Um, and so that's one thing that I really love. And maybe with that or, or other things, are there things that you kind of take from your career um, as an elite into running, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, like workouts or mindsets or attitudes that have really kind of like, in your opinion, helped you step into those longer distances? I think the number one thing I said earlier is I'm really stubborn. And I think on the track, I could prove myself in so many different ways and I could achieve faster times and I could always do better. And right now, when I want a challenge, I have to like, I'm the type of person who does want to be challenged constantly, but I have to create them for myself because people aren't standing there with a stopwatch trying to like time me anymore. So, um, for me, that's what running is kind of like allowing me to continue to be competitive. Even if it's just me by myself, like if I want to try and do something I've never done, I have a way now to measure my success. And I think that for me has been like an easy way to transition off the track, still be an individual. I can do it with other people or I can do it by myself, but I just need something to make me feel like I've, I've just got to have something to look forward to like beating or something like that. I think I'm still only a year and a half out of retirement. So maybe that'll die out eventually and I'll just do it more for fun. But right now I'm just like, I got to run faster. That pace wasn't fast enough or I've got to <laughs> run further or something. So um, cool. I just like a challenge. <laughs> It's so funny because I think that I, I've seen that with a whole bunch of different athletes. You know, when you go, when you guys go from that, that, that level of competition into, you know, I don't want to say the age group or level of competition, but kind of like the rest of us level of competition. Um, I was having a conversation with um, a cyclist I know, Kirstie Lay, and one day I was out for a run with her and a buddy, and and she was just talking about like, I just want to run a half marathon today, or just I just want to run twenty one kilometers. It's like, oh. Uh, cool, cool. Okay. Um, that's what's going to happen. So it's, it's yeah. so funny. It's like that, that competitive mindset. Hey, totally. And it's the journal that I was referencing earlier. It's a journal that I write in every single day, regardless of whether it has to do with physical activity. It's just kind of the peak of my day. So every, every single day I write down, this was the thing I want to remember next year. And it's really cool to see how like me running 10 K is in there and me and like the highlight of my day that day was my run. And it's like, I never would have thought as a track athlete, I'm like, speed, speed, speed. Like I'm not going far. And now it's like the highlight of my day to the point where it makes it in there. And I was like, I ran 7k with run crew <laughs> or some of the other days. My accomplishments were like 
enormous or like, it was really like monumental moments in my life or my family. And, and to be like 7k was like the thing that day that made me feel awesome. And so I'm really glad that I have that journal for that. Yeah. You know, running is a special thing. And I find cool. especially now, you know, going for a 5k or 10k run, like that is literally the highlight of my day. And yeah, this was sort of a recurring theme in last week's talk. It was like, it literally represents freedom right now because when we're totally. doing what we should do, that's like our escape. Yeah. <laughs> so quickly, I just want to ask Rachel a question because when you look at her background in track and field and, and all these shorter, intensive, very painful type uh, activities, I find that I came from sort of that background as well. And it's quite a skill set or a mental skill set to be able to shift into what we would consider that mundane and boring ultra endurance side of that fatigue and that, that discomfort pain, just slowly creeping in and <laughs> go past the five kilometer mark to the eight kilometer to the 10. But the perception is completely different from your background. How are you adjusting to that? Are you, are you taking it all in or are you kind of getting bored and you're looking for people, like I said, to chat with or putting your earphones in or like, how are you accommodating that? Uh, I don't know if you'll love my answer, <laughs> but so we were never allowed to listen to music. We've never been allowed to listen to music when we worked out. That's just like, my coach was like, I, if I talk, I want you to hear me. So what I do is I, I only listen to country music. So I have this like really slow, sappy, romantic country playlist that I put in my ears and I go for my runs and I just run until I feel like stopping. So I haven't really hit that stage where I'm like pushing through pain because I don't. And so even in like the 10, the 15, the distances I've never run before, I'm not running like a 410 pace. So I'm not really like finding myself to be that physically challenged. And I run into this problem all the time where I'll run way too far from my house. And then I'm like, oh, I'm done. And then I have to walk home because I just like, I kind of finish when I finish. <laughs> and so I like, I haven't really encountered a, a moment when I have to push through the pain yet. But I will say when I'm with other people, I often run further than I know I would have stopped if I was by myself. So I think the easiest thing for me, if I really want to have to push through the pain, I've got to be with somebody who will keep me there or pace me at a, maybe a, an easier pace to get that distance because by myself, I typically just stop. <laughs> Rachel, you literally sound like the most Zen runner I've ever I'm seen. I'm so chill. <laughs> <laughs> um, great question, Cal. Thanks for that. Um, I've got a couple of Instagram questions that we had that came in. Uh, one of them was, what is your, this one came from Jeff and it's like, what is or was your favorite like bread and butter work running workout so we did two types of running workouts we only did two types of running workouts we did our short speed and we did what we called like our speed endurance and so our short speed workouts we would do five or maybe like four or five times 450s so we would run 50 meters walk back 50 meters walk back 50 meters walk back then we'd rest for three minutes and we would do that like four times so that was our speed work. So we would just do 50 meter sprints. And then on our speed endurance days, we would do 300, 250, 120, or we would do 120, 120, 120. That was it. As far as running goes, we did short sprints. So 50 meters max, or we did 300, 250, 120. And that was it. I love that. And I'm talking one rep. Like I'm not talking multiple. I'm saying we did a 300, we rested for five or six minutes. Then we did a 250, we rested. And then we did like a 150. So we never ran that much. And like I, as an open 800 meter runner, I didn't have an awesome time. But as a heptathlete, I ran a 210, 800, which is like pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and so with pretty minimal running training, it worked. <laughs> Great. I'm done. That's what I'm doing now. Michelle, you converted me. Three reps and then go home. <laughs> Less is more, right? Less is more, absolutely. They were just really fast. <laughs> wow. One of the other questions we got came all the way from France. The balcony mm -hmm. marathon guy, Alicia, wants to know, would you ever do a, uh, a half or a full marathon? Yeah. I, all my life, I thought 5K would be like my peak. And last year I ran a 5K at the Calgary Marathon and was like, shit that was hard shoot sorry that was hard and this year I'm like there's no way I'll definitely run a half marathon in the next year and as a marathon I don't know if I'm there yet but for sure I'll run a half that's super that's that's what we're waiting 
I, I'm sure Kirsten will throw an entry your way and get you into the a marathon or 50k one day and Cal knows all about that so um, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and um, so for those of you who are just joining us coach Cal is a uh, triathlon endurance coach uh, with critical speed and um, Cal why don't you just uh, talk a little bit about kind of the work that you do and the coaching and, and your what you do yeah, well, you know, I grew up as an athlete and I just loved doing sport and sort of I did, decided to study that formally. I did an undergrad in uh, physical education, but uh, found out after spending two years being a weight technician at the Eau Claire Y downtown Calgary, I decided I need to do more with this. And I went and did my master's degree at the University of Calgary, studied under Dr. David Smith, and I specialized in endurance performance. And so you know, it was related to endurance running or uh, triathlon. And then after I actually studied that and published a paper or two, I decided I was going to offer this type of service to the community. And uh, pretty much we were the founding uh, people that did that. I don't think back 30 some years ago that that was really the stable thing to do. And uh, we worked primarily with runners at the beginning. Uh, and as I said, we move into our athletes. And then I actually uh, stumbled across a couple athletes that uh, were climbing Mount Everest. So I actually worked with them, Alan Hobson and Jamie Clark, and they were the ninth and 10th Canadians to climb Mount Everest. So the physiology behind training an athlete, whether it's climbing Everest or doing their first ever 10K, once you understand the physiology and the premise behind soft tissue development and all that sort of thing, uh, it comes very natural to me to design programs for endurance athletes. Um, you know, obviously the energetics behind things is just, you know, trying to figure out what the person is trying to accomplish. Again, is it endurance based or is it aerobic power based? Has it got spurts of intensity such as alternation and terrain like cross country skiing? all of those sort of things. And so that's kind of what I specialize, anything endurance based. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in so-called personal training, working in the weight room and doing all those creative things, but certainly uh, I enjoy the aspect of ultra endurance and endurance based sport. So we, we can really classify, and this is one thing that Rachel can attest to is that even, even the mile or 1500 meters on the track, it's 50% anaerobic and 50% aerobic. So when we actually embark on a journey that's say even up to 5k, it's 90%, 95% aerobic, like beyond that mile, we're looking at the endurance territory. So um, again, it's a niche that I like doing personally anyways. And uh, again, I, I just enjoy working with athletes that are motivated and, and are passionate about trying to test their own limits. Yeah. That's super cool. And I think that, you know, I think, I think Rachel actually probably, you know, described it best. You know, we, you want to see how far you can push yourself. And I think that one of the questions we feel a lot. So as, as everybody knows, you know, every, a couple of days before we do these talks, I send out a, um, a poll on Instagram, just fielding questions, finding out what people want to know from our, our panel. One of the most common questions I get is just what advice is there for, for runners who are doing their first K 5k, or coming back from an injury, or they haven't ran in 10 years, like, what would you, what are the, the maybe two or three most critical things um, that you would tell somebody who's either getting into 5k for the first time, or getting back into running for the first time, and Rachel, I'm going to ask you uh, your opinion on that as well afterwards. Yeah, well, my advice is more on the scientific and the, and the body structural, is whether or not a person is, is able to accommodate that much time on their feet, for instance. Uh, are they um, of optimal weight? Are they overweight? Do they have joint issues? Do they have injury issues? That sort of thing. So I approach it from that standpoint. Um, so are they safe to actually do uh, a day where they're on their feet, whether it's walk, run, or a combination? And then do they need a day off or two days off kind of thing? It's just to try to find out what they call the loading. Like what is the loading that will help them achieve that endurance side of things? without sacrificing your health. So the big premise behind this is you never sacrifice your health for your fitness goals. And so there might be some people out there that really their endurance capacity is five kilometers, not because they don't necessarily wanna go longer or not that, that they don't have that internal central endurance, it's more structural. So their, their knees get sore, their ankles get sore, whatever it may be. And so working with each individual case, we have to figure out where their limiters are 
And some people actually they start running and they find that they have this unique ability to have that that diesel gear, if you know what I mean. That that's that gear that no, they can't run a 10k very quick, but they can go for hours, like hours. That's not me. I know what my limitations are, but uniquely they have this ability to just carry on. And part of it is mental, but a lot of it is what we call structural constitution. Are they built? to be able to handle repetitive strain for hours and hours and hours. And each individual is different. So I really try to work with them individually and figure out what that may be. And then for me, having the notion of cross training, meaning getting in the water, getting on a bicycle, um, we snowshoe in the winter, we do all these different things. Um, I think you could probably build up that tolerance. So even a beginner runner, when they're trying to expand that endurance, I get them to hike. I just get them to go and do long hikes. And so if their longest hike is say an hour, we try to build up the duration of that as opposed to necessarily pushing them to run longer. The running longer is, or running should be more about a frequency thing where they're gonna run maybe a day on, day off, but their long run truly could be a hike. And I think that's a great way of approaching things. And I learned that lesson last year or two years ago when I was training for a big race in Sweden it's the world championships in swim run and it's called Utele, which means island to island. And it's something that I was absolutely petrified. So Rachel, when you talk about, oh, I'm gonna run my first 5K or 10K, <laughs> I probably hadn't run anything more than say 40 kilometers. And I was signed up for this event that we traveled through 26 islands in the Swedish archipelago. And by the time the day was done, we had run 65 kilometers and swam 10 kilometers. Mm. Excuse my French, but I was shitting my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I, Hearing honestly, that, I'm like. It, well, what a shift it was for me to try to figure out how I'm gonna go from an athlete that paid, maybe runs 60 kilometers a week to now getting to this structural strength and this, this resilience to be able to make myself through this. Not only that, as I was a paired up with an, another person. So in swim run, you actually do it as a partnership uh, for safety and other reasons. But the person I was paired up with was a, a premier ultra marathoner, Myron Tetrode. And I was scared to death. This guy is like had run hundred mile races. So it, I had to pretty much put, put myself in the position like as if I was a beginner runner if you want to call it yeah. that. So, so a lot of my training came back to doing really long hikes. And the way that I loaded my structural constitution, so to say, my body, is I actually would walk and hike with ankle weights, and I actually would walk and hike with, with uh, weight packs. So it was a great way for me to get stronger without necessarily spending nine hours out there. I would do a four-hour hike with ankle weights and and a weight vest and I would come back absolutely cooked. But it was a great way. I didn't necessarily have to do a ton of running to get ready for that. So so everyone's a little bit different, but you just have to find out where the person is starting from and figure out the tools in order to so-called train the body to be resilient to the repetitive strain of running and hiking. Yeah, well, and I think you raised such a good point there because when, when people ask me that same question, one of the things I come back to them with well, it's really hard to answer that question because every person is coming from such a different place. And I think, you know, I think you pointed out there, that's, that's one of the benefits of working with a coach or somebody who has experience, who's seen lots of different individual cases before, um, because it's not one size fits all. So, um, Rachel, what would, what would you like tell somebody kind of getting into it for the first time? I, I honestly just want to highlight a few things that Cal said because they were so spot on with my transition as well. My knees just killed me and I had nobody to tell me to take a day off and I wasn't the type of person that really, really wanted to take a day off, especially when I'm like, okay, one run doesn't mean I'm done kind of thing. So I think the most important thing is to listen to your body because especially for me, like on a track, especially in hurdles and in the hundred, like it's linear. Everything is forward and backwards. There's the terrain is just, you know, it. it's, it's flat. It's even. And even on the sidewalk, you know, you dodge a rock or you step down and then back up. And like, I was moving in ways I'd never moved before. And like my first run was probably 5k and my knees were killing me. And so I think not only like loading it slowly, but like listening to your body when your body responds, because 
I like ran and then didn't run for three days because I couldn't because my knees hurt. So just taking that time. And, and the only other thing I would add is just if you're new to it or you're getting back into it to do it with someone else. Like I really don't think I'd be a runner now if I didn't have YYZ run crew to start. Um, and then crush camp to transition because once I started coaching at crush camp, I had a whole other community of people and they had a run crew. But if I didn't have people to run with, I doubt that I would actually have ran that much. The social aspect makes such a difference completely. Huge. Yeah. And accountability too. They can't stop halfway. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so coach Cal right now we're in kind of this tailspin. We're living in this like weird, I call it like a black mirror reality because everyone's communicating like digitally now and, um, bike rides and bike races are like existing in Zwift and Ruby and stuff like that. Um, how have you adjusted your training slash, um, or alternatively, how have you adjusted the training programs of some of your athletes that you're coaching? We, we have a, I've already fielded a couple questions here for, this is a, this is gonna be loaded, but we have some people like all the triathletes, none of us are swimming. Um, you know, are you just kind of loading on the volume to make sure that everybody's kind of set for the other parts of their races? Are you like, what's the transition been like? Yeah, it's been an interesting transition. Um, I'm hedging on the fact that we'll be able to continually go outside and ride our bikes, um, run all that sort of stuff. There's no doubt. So you know, doing indoor workouts right now using Zoom. Um, I usually do these so-called brick workouts where we do biking, running, and core conditioning workouts that go up to about five hours. So at this time, well, before the pandemic and the lockdown, we were doing, I think we had done one five-hour workout already. So my athletes actually were fairly fit already going into this so-called mid-March. And my goal basically to offer them was just a way that they could probably lose as little as as uh, as much as little as we can in terms of the fitness that we've gained and worked so hard for so yeah we're doing these zoom brick workouts on Sundays that last three hours and they're a combination of biking and biking um, components such as single leg drills big gear push pull standings ups and downs all those skill sets that we need for a cycling um, but I also during the break periods I get them to do swim pulls or conditioning, so bridging, one leg lifts, side leg lifts, planks, and all that sort of stuff. So incorporating the aspects of swimming, um, of course we can't replicate that that well, but at least we can keep some of the muscles stimulated and the strength up. Um, I incorporate that with the cycling uh, intervals that we do on these longer days. And so um, we're riding, well, some of them are riding six days a week through some of my Zoom classes that I'm doing. And then, as I said, within those, we're doing some swim poles and band work and that sort of stuff. There's nothing we can do other than that, really, for swimming. Um, it's something that I learned when I was training for some of my World Xterra races. Um, on the North Shore of Kapalua, the ocean is extremely violent. Like the last race that I did, we had 16 foot shore break. So it's <laughs> violent. The ocean was violent. Wow. It's scary. It's absolutely petrifying. And all the locals yeah. say, how could you even have a race on that tip of the island? Yeah. It's insane. Like you can't do it. So what I it found is <laughs> for me to have a safe performance is that I did a tremendous amount of swim poles and tubing and strengthening just using basic band work. And so some of that conditioning I've now incorporated into our bike workouts. And so the triathletes, I think, are appreciating that. And there's not much more that we can do. And, and the running aspect is fairly simple. Obviously, some people have treadmills during this long, extended winter that we're having in Calgary. And most people actually end up going outside. So um, we're just trying to weave in as much training as we possibly can and then just hope that as the summer uh, starts to arrive and that we can potentially get out to doing some open water swimming, we'll, we'll just blend right back into that. But even that is unknown. We don't even know if we're going to have access into lakes in communities. We, we just don't know. So, you know, we're just kind of trying to make things work as best as possible. And I think as endurance athletes, we still need to be able to, to keep moving. We need to have some sort of goal and objective uh, on a daily basis to keep our minds busy because there's so much time in a day now. It's ridiculous how much time we have. I'm just like, geez, what do I do with my time? And with us not, you know, having races and looking forward to something like, uh, you know, an event that has a, a, 
a, a date, a specific time, it's hard for us to regroup and re-engineer our thoughts as to how we should do something. So that's part of my job is to try to keep people's motivation up and, and say, hey, you know, there is hope that we may have a late summer or even a fall race season. And even if we don't have a race season, why would you want to give away one year or summer of fitness knowing that by next year we'll be racing it anyways. It doesn't make any sense. And yet we really step back and say, we love what we do. So, yeah. you know, giving them direction and giving them options. And then, as you know, just like what we're doing here is that this is somewhat social. It's not the old days per se, yeah. a month yeah. and a half ago, but at least it has some social interaction. I think we, as human beings, we need that for sure. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's, I mean, that's probably part of the reason we're seeing, I mean, you go into Zwift at any time of day now. And for those of you who don't know, Zwift is this, this uh, virtual endurance platform for cyclists and to a lesser degree runners, but you go on at any time of day now and there's 20, 30,000 people on there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've gone from doing just like my trainer road workout, staring at a number yeah. to doing these Zwift workouts, just because I know that there's other people there, which is super weird because it's still just a computer, but that social aspect is so important to like to performance and to, you know, setting goals and stuff like that. It, it's kind of keeping people kind of level through this, especially athletes. Um, I got oh, a go I ahead. was going to ask a question. Go for it. Um, both for both uh, Callan and Rebecca is uh, Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Strangely, I get Rebecca a lot, you know? <laughs> and so uh, you guys are both very elite individual athletes but very goal oriented it sounds like for both of you right now we don't quite have goals to focus on um do you guys have mind tricks that you play on your with yourselves or little trick things that you're using to keep yourself moving and going out there when we don't quite have a goal to hit even though we're trying to stay active through this downtime without that goal orientation that a lot of runners do have how do you want to go uh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> Great. No, you know what? I have the best resource and it's Crush Camp because I, that's a, um, okay. So if you're not familiar with Crush Camp, it is a fitness studio here in Calgary and we have the curved skill mills that are kind of like the hamster wheels. You move the belt and there's different resistances. And so that's what I was introduced to after track. And they have a six week challenge going on right now. And it's super easy. It's move 30 minutes a day but they hold you accountable and there's a leaderboard and you have to write in every day what you did. And for me right now, to be honest, some days to move 30 minutes only because there's a crush camp six week challenge going on is like what gets me up and out the door. And that's to be completely candid through this time. I have had to lean on that community to like get me off the couch. <laughs> so that's, that's it for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's that old saying like what, what gets measured gets done and yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I have a group of athletes that basically I'm leading. So I, I'm always trying to lead by example. And then uh, personally, I like being fit, not in peak, peak form all the time. But when you're super fit, it usually allows you to go out and do a very easy, relaxed workout and enjoy it. And that, that really is the big thing for me. So like, again, today I did a three hour run hike. I, I didn't run the whole time. I, I barely covered 20 kilometers in three hours, what eight minute per kilometer pace, but I enjoyed every moment of it. And that's, that's what it's about. Really, it's, it's about developing that endurance and fitness so that you can enjoy it. Now, there's no doubt coming from so-called a performance uh, background, there are workouts that really suck, that really are uncomfortable. And we have to go into that pain tolerance side of things if you want to perform well. But the majority of our workouts, we really, really like. And I think when the fitter you are, the more that you'll enjoy things. And so that's pretty much my goal is, is I learned way back in high school, uh, I think it was 15, whatever the time was, that I actually stopped exercising. And then cross country season came around for high school. And I could not believe how shitty I felt trying to get back into a normal exercise program. And to that day, from that day, I vowed I would never get out of shape again because it's way, way, way too hard to get back into shape. You might as well just keep things going, even keeled, peak when you need to peak for your goal races or events or virtual racing or whatever you want to do, but maintain a baseline. It's way better. It's way easier. And you'll enjoy it way more. 
So that's my motivation is I really don't ever let my fitness go. So last year, I think I trained two hours a day average on, Star on Strava. Yeah. 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 And, that's, and not every day was that. It's just some weekends were bigger than others. It just worked out to be that number. But to just give you an idea, two hours a day. And again, like Rachel, is part of this is because I lead groups. I would never expect anybody to do that, but because we're in front of our athletes and we have to do things with them, it's easy for us to reach those numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like a big part of being a coach at Crush Camp, I think is leading by example, just like you said. And I think uh, I had one of my clients reach out and she challenged myself and another coach and she's like, who can run the farthest in an hour? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so I had to get up off the couch and like go race. And I was like, this client has put me to the test this week. So I went out, beat her. <laughs> but it like, honestly, my pace dropped quite a bit from like my leisurely runs. So like you said, you enjoy some of them and you kind of like try and push a little harder on other ones and they're not all the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so important. I think, you know, there's so many different ways to view this time. And I think that there's people out there, they want, if you, if this is like your rest time, because so many of us ask for rest and like in life and stuff like that, you got to take that. But if, you know, if you have that inkling or that desire, or you just kind of like, you know, want to go outside. I tell people like chase that down, like go for it because, you know, we have the time, you know, I, one thing I always tell people is um, a half hour run is like 2.3% of your day. You yep. know, so if you can find the time to do that and keep that even keel, power to you. Um, Tyler, I'm going to pivot over to you a little bit. Um, there was a lot of people, a lot of questions that came in for you um, about shoes and all that fun stuff. Um, I'll try and like distill it a little bit. But first of all, tell us a little bit what you do at Saucony and, um, you know, kind of your background. So I guess what I do at Saucony now is I say, I'm a sales guy. I'm a, I sell to key accounts. So I sell to national accounts from, you know, the large accounts, whether it's sport check, running room, MEC, um, you know, et cetera, across the board there. So that's basically what I do. I look at spreadsheets these days um, and I get to play with product. But um, my background with Saucony came from, and, and, and mainly my background was just, it's, I've, I've loved shoes since I was a child. So I was like nine years old. And I was like, mom, dad, I, I could get one shoe a year every year. That was all we could afford. If I grew out of the shoe, I better scrunch up my toes. Um, and that one year I was like, I want the Jordan six. And my parents were like, what? Okay. Like normally it's like, I want a blue shoe, but that year I wanted Jordan six. And it was because it had a neoprene booty and visible mats air and two holes in the tongue to pull it up. And my parents were like, whatever. And marketing worked on me. And, uh, but the next year it wasn't a Jordan that I wanted. The next year I wanted the Barkley because the whole shoe was max air. And then the next year I was like, oh, I need a turf trainer that Emmett Smith wears because he's playing football and I love football. And, you know, I always came from the multi-sport world where I played football and soccer pretty competitively. And, uh, and so I jumped around from shoe to shoe, but it was always like tech this, tech that. And so I liked new cushioning systems, new foams, new uppers and and so I, that stuff always fully got like I got into and so I worked retail for years and I worked in the running world of retail for years and then uh, I became a like what you call a tech rep and basically just went around educating people in Alberta and Saskatchewan about shoes oh, and I talk about shoes in general and I still love nerding out on shoe websites and reading reviews for all brands and so that's kind of where I came from and what I do now and how I got into it. And it's, you know, I, I'm here as a shoe guy working for a brand, but more or less, I'm just a nerd for shoes. And I just love technology and looking at how, you know, one brand's trail shoe may do this and another brand's trail shoe might do that. And then, you know, we've got all the racing shoe rage, you know, rage right now of like carbon plates and different foams and all of that. And so it's, I don't know. That's just what I nerd out on. So yeah. it's not movies, it's running shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Ty has also got one in a movie with Ty, if anybody uh, wants something to check out and get his commentary on movies. So um, I'm going to toss a softball your way just to kind of get the conversation going. But one of the questions that I got um, came from Haley Zopel, and she asked, I need some good running shoes. I've been looking online, but I have no clue where to begin. Any new runner recommendations? Nothing crazy in price, 150 bucks. What what do you recommend for running shoes? Because right now, especially with this kind of like back to basics kind of 
fitness time I see a lot of people out there running and like what are not running shoes because I feel like some people are just like running for the first time in like a decade yeah I would say for a lot of people that are just just entering running they don't have to go to an expensive shoe right away for a lot of them they are getting out there and trust me I saw somebody running out in a uh and well they, a lot of people running in retro running shoes right now because they're just like well they're runners um and it breaks my heart a bit but <laughs> you don't have to go to an expensive shoe right away I do think their best bet still is visiting a local run shop and I'm going to continue probably re repeating this throughout it but if they were trying to buy something online um through Saucony I would say a really good you know workhorse shoe would be the ride which is a neutral cushion shoe it just gives you enough cushioning but like something in the 140 to 160 dollar price range is going to take a person who wants to just enter running to even far more distance but they can find a slightly older version of that same model for a little bit of a less price as well um, because if they're just trying to get in there that's what i would probably say um, I don't want to go into specific models necessarily yeah. for them because it's it's so hard to know exactly what that person's going to need and then they're going to be like well the shoe guy on the talk described <laughs> this to me and now my ankles hurt or my knees hurt yeah and that's the challenge on that um i say for the first for a person to start running look at a neutral trainer in about that mid to moderate level of cushioning and you know make sure that they've got their own their right size the reason i say a neutral shoe there is we don't know if they need any correction or anything that comes in some of those extra bells and whistles and shoes and a stability shoe. And so a neutral shoe will give them added cushioning from something that's just entry level and yet they can uh, figure out what works best for them after that if they continue to run. Cool, and so for the uninitiated, do you wanna to explain to us what a neutral shoe is? Yes, sorry. <laughs> so a neutral shoe is, I've got shoes. Um, <laughs> A neutral shoe is a shoe that gives you plenty of, of cushioning, but it doesn't direct your foot either inside or outside. It just allows your foot to land and give you enough support around your foot and, and cushioning underneath your foot, but it still allows your body to direct which direction the shoe is going to move. So a lot of people will, and then when we talk about a stability shoe, we talk about a shoe that when the person kind of turns in and their ankles and knees, you know, show that angle towards the inside that's without being way more detailed where we talk about its hips and everything that come into play but uh when they start rolling in to the inner arch area of their foot you'll see them more aggressively roll that way that's going to be a person who over pronates normally is what we would say and you'll get a stability shoe that on the arch area of the shoe has a little bit of additional support um, and it's going to be like a harder material. And what that does is it's like a post on a bridge. If you've got like a, a wooden plank bridge all the way across and you put a post on just one side of it, the, the plank's going to have to go up and over that. And that's what that does on that shoe. So instead of you rolling in so far, it keeps you a little bit more sturdy and flat and even keeled there. Cool. Does that, help? That, that helps a lot, Rachel. So helpful. <laughs> I've literally never, I don't know anything about shoes. That was very informative. I, yeah, I can answer questions if you want. <laughs> I think we could even, we could do like a three hour talk on on just shoe technology. Um, one of the another question that came up, and this one came from Kimber. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kimber Kimber runs with us on Sunday morning. She's also a frontline uh, worker right now, so she's kind of at the front of this at the South Health Campus. So, Kimber, thank you very much for everything that you do, and thank you to all of the uh, frontline uh, workers and staff who uh, who everywhere but especially those of you who who we run with and who we know personally but Kimber's asking um and this is gonna be one of those questions where every person's different but shoe suggestions for knee injury or pain so i saw that that was coming through and when when it comes to knee pain i mean there can be a few different questions this is where you definitely want to assess where that knee pain is stemming from because if it's you know is it knee pain right on the inside of the knee? Are you feeling it on the lateral side or on, sorry, the inside of your knee or on the outside of your knee? Um, is it in the back of your knee? And this is where something can really come into play in getting assessed and figuring out what is the stem of that knee pain. If you're finding that it's just, you know, it's 
it's knee pain from exhaustion and such. And it's, so it doesn't hurt you right at the beginning of the run, but as the run goes on, it's hurting, it's aching, and then it stops after the run. Um, for one, you might want to slow down and pace yourself, run, walk. And as we were even, you know, Coach Cal was saying, you know, some people just go out and run and it's too much for them and, and they're going to get some knee pain. For one, I'm one who's had multiple knee surgeries and um, so I feel that pain sometimes when I go too far or too hard, but I'm not too smart. Um, the other thing is cushioning. So if you're really trying to push that distance, sometimes you can elevate the level of cushioning that you have in your shoe that may benefit you. But again, understanding where that knee pain comes will help you assess it better. Um, but you also don't want to go to a necessarily a lighter weight cushioning shoe in most cases. So there's, there's the odd person that does respond well to a more flexible, lighter weight shoe because it changes the way that their body tends to land. But they, uh, I would say cushioning will be your first thing that you want to look at along with getting assessment. Even, uh, again, a local run shop, if you don't want to go to a physio or something like that, a local run shop will be able to do an on-site assessment to say, hey, you might want to try something like this that will give you better specifics. Yeah. And um, a couple of points there that I want to kind of focus in on, but one of them is, uh, you know, seeing a professional is such an important thing. Last year, I think I mentioned this last, uh, last week as well, but last year I myself was having knee pain and I just couldn't track down what it was. And I saw a fantastic um, physio named Tyson Plesek, who we had on here a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, we did slow-mo analysis of the way that I was running and he was finding that like my knee was crossing over my leg was crossing over the center line so because my vmo wasn't activating and just kind of everything was going wrong so you know getting in the right shoe and seeing a specialist and then seeing somebody a physio or whoever it may be can be a real game changer for any of the runners who are kind of getting into it here um quick plug next week on we're having malk kent is joining us from the uk so malk has done a lot of really really incredible research around remote gait analysis Malk also worked on the Enos uh, 159 project and the Nike Sub 2 project. So um, his job is looking at like what shoes should be on an athlete and how their body moves in relation to those. So I definitely encourage anybody if they want to get into like a super geeky talk about um, about run gate and technology, uh, definitely tune in with us uh, next week. So uh, we have a question here from Haley. I found uh, for me with my knee pain, it was finding shoes that with the right drop. Tyler, can you explain shoe drop to us, please? You explained yeah. it in such a way, a great way for me the first time. I was supposed to do a little intro, intro on shoes, sorry. Um, so shoe drop and shoes just in general are created where in the shoe, your, guy, your heel is a little bit higher than your toe in most shoes. And so shoes will call that or shoe brands will call that an offset or a heel to toe drop. Um, and different people can respond differently to two different drops and shoe brands. There's no one standard across all territories. So for quite a long time, shoe brands, basically 12 millimeter was the standard heel to toe drop, which is the ramp your foot sits on like that. And so you'd have a 12 meter, millimeter distance or your heel would be 12 millimeters higher than your forefoot would be in the shoe. Um, and for a long time, 12 millimeters was a relative standard. I guess you could still say that. What you, we did see in, in recent history is a lot of brands have created, you know, different staggers of shoe heel to toe drop in shoes. And it's really worked to benefit some runners that really want to have a lower, flatter shoe. And there's shoe brands that go down to a zero toe drop and excel very well in there. And then there are some that get up to... 12 millimeter, there was a, uh, way back when I was working at another brand, there was a shoe that was like a 15 millimeter heel to toe drop stability shoe, and it was just very aggressive. Um, so heel to toe drop is that ramp that you roll on, and what you'll find is road running shoes range everywhere in most brands from four to 12 millimeters. Um, and then you'll get a trail running shoes. A lot of brands go to four millimeters, but then you know, you're again ranging probably from 10 millimeters to four millimeters out of most brands on trail running. And from everything I've been taught about shoes is just 
having a slightly lower drop on trail just makes you a little bit more adaptable to the terrain because unlike road where it's a lot of repetitive motion on the same almost flat surface the whole time when you start hitting trail you're getting ups and downs and side curves and everything so i always say if you know if you had a high heel to toe drop on a trail when you're going downhill your heel lands and then your toe has got to drop way to, way further below it adds a greater amount of you know strain on that front of your shin bone area and then if you're going uphill and you've got a steep uphill if you're landing heel to toe wrong then you're probably doing everything else in life wrong as well so <laughs> um you know um, it, it, it's so funny you should mention that because i was wearing one of my um a pair of shoes that i had with a higher stack and, and a, a bigger drop and it was I went on this long downhill run, like I think there was like two kilometers of downhill. And I found like the next day or two days later, I was getting this like kind of this weird, not pain, but like just a discomfort, like a compression kind of feeling in the front of my shin. So yeah, it, it's actually really interesting that you should say that because it kind of like puts it in my mind there. Like the terrain I was kind of on was a little bit more akin to what I might see on a trail run, but I was happy to be wearing like a high stack height, like shoe with a lot more drop. So interesting. The one thing I will say is, again, on drop, is there's no, like, this is the best way to go. And there's a lot of literature out there that is natural motion is the way. You want a lower heel to toe drop. And then there's some places that, you know, will say, oh, no, no, no it's too low. It's going to cause tension on your calf or your Achilles and things of that sort. Um, even in my running experience, even though I prefer a more flexible lower heel to toe drop shoe, uh, mixing it up really benefits you in having a, some shoes that have a slightly higher ramp and then some shoes that are slightly lower ramp. And depending on what you're trying to get out of your training, again, Coach Cal spoke about this earlier, is understanding that load that you're putting on your body and what you're trying to get out of your training and out of your run. Different shoes do have different, they're, they're like different tools in your toolbox. So they have different abilities to help drive your body in a different way. And so even though there are a lot of different drops, it's really beneficial to have a couple different shoes that are different styles of shoes that help train your body to move in different ways as opposed to just the same stagnant movement all the time in the same shoe. Yeah. Buy more shoes. Tyler, I, I, I totally agree with that comment about having different stack shoes or different drops. And another the reason why I think we should actually, most of us should do some trail work is because of that unpredictability in that drop. And, and really you don't want to be locked into a certain range of motion over many, many, many miles or countless months of training because your fascia and the joint basically gets locked in that position. And I think it's really important that you keep your body supple and the fascia supple. And that can be done just indirectly by switching your shoes off to a, you know, a four mil drop to a six mil drop back and forth. And then the other notion is that, as you know, this in the show, shoe industry is that your favorite shoe gets discontinued. Oh my God. You know, we've had like nightmares, panic attacks by some runners and triathletes. They can't find their favorite shoe. And then of course they're for forced into going into a different shoe that may be slightly different. And then we know that when we do change anything in that loading process of that many foot strikes, you want to kind of do it gradual. So if you are making a dramatic change in your footwear, make sure that you're incorporating that footwear slowly every second run where you actually get that, that foot on. And I, I went through, I, I actually wore, uh, wore Saucony in my last world championships in Xterra. I actually bought a pair of spikes um, because I was anticipating mud, but it was literally zero drop. Oh my God. Like it yeah. took me two months to get used to running in zero drop shoes again. I'm not, 15 years old running track anymore. Like it's very difficult to get to that point. So I just slowly had to reintroduce this type of drop footwear so that I could accommodate that in the race. And um, it was a real eye opener to, real, to realize the way my body, uh, the fascia has gotten shorter as I've gotten older. So, and then I just want to say one more thing about the knee aspect of having painful knees. What I notice is that when I go and do some running, when it's cold out, say minus 15, or actually for that matter, minus 10, my knees get sore. 
and and this is something that beginners need to realize that when it is cold and you're carrying an extra two or three pounds of uh, clothing, it's really easy for us to get sore knees. And it's not necessarily because you're not running correctly or any of that sort of stuff. But what they've proven in some research, and Ben O'Neill at the University of Calgary was a, a key instrumental uh, part of this research, is that the vibrational frequency, the vibration stress of pounding is different when it's that cold. And the shoes, as you know, the upper and in, in the way that the shoe cushions that vibration in the stress, the frequency is different. And so it's not uncommon even for someone like Trevor Hoffbauer or somebody that's just this amazing runner that does copious amount of volume, that when they come back from a cold weather run, that they actually have sore joints. And it's not that, again, the footwear is incorrect or any of that. It's just, again, the changes of environment. So the tip for that is that if you are scheduled to go and do one of your longer runs when it's quite cold, you may want to actually back that off by 20%. Don't go 90 minutes. Go 75 or go 60 when it's that cold. Or do half of it on a treadmill and then do half outside. But just be very, very careful about the type of ground forces that we have when the weather gets very cold. Okay. That's what I've noticed anyway. Yeah. So it's not that anybody's doing anything wrong. It's just our environment. We have to be careful of that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I definitely echo that as well because you know, it, we are climatized to very cold temperatures and our perception of cold here is very different. And I think that once you get down to like the minus tens and minus 15s, there's not a lot of gear that's made for, for those temperatures. So I think we all have to be a little bit mindful that uh, we're a hardy people here up in Canada and our standards for what normal running temperatures are a little bit, a little bit skewed. Um, if anybody has any questions, we've got uh, the lines are, the lines are open. I feel like PBS here, but um, we still have a few more minutes here. Andrew's got a question uh, for you, Tyler. Do more modern shoes need to be broken in, or is that just uh, something that Andrew's mom told him to make him uh, use his shoes longer? <laughs> it, that's a pretty funny one, actually. So way back, your mom was probably really honest because shoes materials have become so much more pliable now than what they were made and there were more stitched over layovers different types of foams um back when you were a kid i know i know how old you are now so it was a while ago um <laughs> but, uh, but shoes have become so much more pliable that they really are constructed to be run right out of the box but to say that is still something that it's knowing your body and very much the biggest thing about distance running is knowing your body, knowing your limits, knowing how your body reacts to things. And so I use for an example, and I, I had a big conversation with a couple people while I was in Calgary is, uh, and I, I like to use this example was it was a running group. And I was on that, that commentary page and one person said, hey, I just bought this shoe. I'm really excited about it. I wanna wear it for long run Sunday tomorrow. And a bunch of people were like, don't do it no matter what, that's terrible. And I said, well, that's not exactly true necessarily either. And I use myself as an example. I can put on any shoe and go for it and I don't get any blisters or anything like that. It doesn't take a break in process for me. If it's comfortable, it's comfortable out of the box. It's comfortable for me to run it. But I said, you gotta know your body. Do you take a bit to adjust to a shoe? Do you find, hey, I put on a new shoe and I get a few blisters or my toes get sore? Or are you a person that can put on a shoe and just go at it for a long run right away? So there have been some people that can put on that shoe. And anyways, the long, long and short of that story is I got the, I told the guys that. And I said, you got to know your body, know that. Ended up, he wore them brand new shoes for a 21K the next day. And he was really happy about it. And the other person said, that's amazing that you were happy about it. I would be in hell if I had done that. So again, it's knowing your body, knowing how you react to the different things that you're doing, just like we're saying is, you know, knowing your body when you're running and seeing what's causing some of the pain is listening to what works best for you. So for example, I'm, I'm a person who, if I do a race, I like to do a race in a brand new pair of shoes. It's a mental thing for me. Um, I always liked it when I played football and I was in university. Now, I couldn't afford new shoes all the time, but I, I liked to wear pretty clean, pretty new shoes for game days in uh, when I was in playing college football and such. As it was just new shoes, made me feel better. I liked it. It was crisp. It didn't seem like it stretched out too much. 
I felt like I had better control. It was probably a mental game as much as it was a uh, physical side of that. But so again, not a hard, fast rule. But for most people, I would say there still needs to be a little bit of a break-in process. Start with smaller runs, build into bigger runs. Yeah, I think that's important too. Just like just knowing that again, it, kind of the theme of the day is knowing your body. But Rachel, what what about for you? Like, because you made you literally made the transition from track spikes to shoes. Did you have any issues like adjusting or injury or just getting used to it? Or I'm gonna make a disclaimer. I'm probably the last person to ever take advice on about shoes. Um, I'm a creature of habit and a lot of things in my life, but. In like 2008, 2009, I bought a pair of Nike Pegasus. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I have never changed that up until a month ago. I've never changed that shoe. So I, I've never found a problem. I've, I'm, I'm like, I can put a shoe on out of the box and go do a full practice in it. I can run hurdles. I can, I can do whatever I need to in a brand new pair of shoes, just like Ty said, like it's nothing for me. And and I don't know, because I did just get a brand new pair of shoes, different brand. And like I said, my knees kind of hurt, but I don't know again if it was because I started running further or because it was a different pair of shoes. But I don't know. I've never known. I don't know the difference. <laughs> no, and I, I think I, I, like, I think the big point that I got out of what I was saying there was just like mixing up your shoes, just because when you get to a point where you can like put on any pair of shoes or, or just be really comfortable in a whole bunch of different pairs of shoes. It really, really helps because yeah. I, if you get too used to something and you're not, you're not like Rachel who can just put anything on, um, it can be really challenging. So, well, Cal made a great point where he said, if he had an athlete that had this shoe, they had to have it. Like things happen. Your suitcases don't come to meet. It's like you can show up somewhere and need those in particular shoes. And if you can't run without those shoes, you might be in trouble, which would have been the case with me where I only wore the same pair of shoes my whole entire life. And if those shoes weren't on my feet the day of a meet, I probably would have been more messed up here than I would have been on my feet. So yeah, it goes yeah. both ways. Yeah. And I was just going to say, as I've gotten older, I find that my feet don't adapt to radical type feeling shoes. Often I need to, I put them on and if they feel good, I'm usually good to go. But when I walk around in the store or whatever it is, and they just feel like there's pressure points or it just doesn't quite feel right, there's no way that they'll work for me as I go into a jog or, or a run or something like that. But, but certainly as I've gotten in my 50s now, my feet are near, not nearly as pliable anymore. So I can't pull off like multiple brands and this sort of stuff. I usually have my two or three brands that work for me. And I usually stay in that sort of that area of, of choice. Yeah. Um... Quickly, Coach Hell, I've got one. I'm going to take one more question here for you. Um, as a coach, because we only have a few minutes left here, as a coach, Cal, how do you approach an athlete that's carrying somewhere between 10 to 15 pounds more than is ideal? Do you worry much about it? Well, absolutely. Carrying a little bit more weight than you want to coming out of this winter hibernation, um, you have to be careful. Again, it comes back to the repetitive strain on your on your joints, on your muscles and fascia and all that sort of stuff. So. Again, uh, one of the ways that we've been able to do this is, is if you do have a heart rate monitor, heart rate will be higher if you're heavier, of course, and so therefore it's telling you to potentially slow down. So what you can do is you can do a workout that's called walking the line, which means that if we have determined somehow through a mathematical formula or testing that you're not supposed to exceed anything greater than a 150 beats a minute, um, you can get an athlete to basically run, jog up to 150 beats a minute. And when they reach that ceiling, they're supposed to walk. And then you walk until your heart rate reaches 120 beats a minute. And then they start running again slowly. And then once they reach 150 beats, they go back and forth. So it's walking the line. And that's a great way to regulate, again, the amount of strain or stress that you may be putting yourself uh, through. And so again, the heavier you are, the higher the heart rate, the higher the impact forces. So, um, but yet you got to get moving. So you want to get calories burned. So this is a great way of protecting it. Now, the ceiling needs to be submaximal. I'm not going to give you something like 10 beats below your maximum heart rate. <laughs> that just doesn't work. So um, Dr. Phil Maffetone is a person that I studied under for a while, and he used uh, maximum aerobic function, which is 180 minus your age. 
Now, for a lot of people, you're going to do the math and go, oh my gosh, is that ever a low heart rate? And the idea is just to keep you in that real aerobic health promoting type intensity. So you can add maybe 10 beats beyond that. And that would be your ceiling. So again, if I was 15 pounds heavier, um, which I could actually induce that. Uh, when I do my peaking for my Xterra races, I run with weight vests. And I actually, as I'm leaning down and dropping weight, I actually add a weight vest for me to increase my muscle strength and my fitness. And so I know what it's like to be 15 pounds heavier than your normal because it's brutal and it's really, really tough to run fast. Throw out the pace clock, base it on heart rate and have a high limit and a low limit and then just do the walking the line. That's probably the best advice I could give anyone that again is just a little bit on the heavy side and then uh, just keep whittling down that weight. The lower you are in heart or in body weight, I think, I think the st stats are is that for every pound that you lose, you save two heartbeats. And that's massive for efficiency and economy. Yeah. So uh, it's all part of it. But I also feel like I don't think we all need to be super light in the off season either. That, that doesn't make any sense either. So that's how I would approach an athlete like that that's running a little bit heavy is just use it heart rate and, and modify your pace. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um we'll close it out with one last question just a fun one a softball one but uh well first of all i'd just like to thank all three of you for coming on today it was fantastic this was a great talk thank you um closing remarks and what are you guys all watching on netflix right now can i go first because i'm so happy right now <laughs> okay <laughs> i can't lie it's not on netflix it's on amazon prime but i've never seen lost before and I started at season one, episode one, and I'm on season six, and it is, I'm obsessed, and I, I'm gonna be so sad when it ends, but it's unbelievable. <laughs> you know how it ends? <laughs> no, I don't, honestly, and I love looking at spoilers. Every time I'm into a show, the first thing I do is Google the ending, because I'm just like, I need to know what happens. And season one, I was like, about to Google, do they get off the island? And I was like, you know what, wait it out. And so I have no idea what happens. It's in some crazy land now, but I recommend that everyone that's still watching needs to get Amazon Prime and needs to watch Lost. <laughs> okay, Lost. Thank you, Rachel. I need to hear your reaction to how it ends. Oh my God, I will, I will share it on social so everyone knows. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel, you're going to need counseling after that. <laughs> I, I already am like just emotionally way too attached to the yeah. show as it is, let alone all the drama going on. <laughs> All right, Tyler, your turn. Uh, what, what do I need to watch? So, what you need to watch. So, I don't watch shows. I watch movies pretty much mainly. Um, man, the most recent movie I've been watching everything on Prime as well recently. I'm gonna say, movie that you didn't watch that's on Prime is Crawl, and it's a it's a horror movie disaster movie where like an a big hurricane is happening in Florida and people get stuck in the crawl space at the bottom of their house oh. and crocodiles get in and they are on the run. It's awesome. <laughs> My chest What's the movie about so being cooped up in your house while you're cooped up in your house? Yeah. Terrible <laughs> idea. All right, bad suggestion. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay, Coach Cal, what about you? Uh, to be honest, I'm not a Netflix guy. Uh, however, the majority of my time spent watching anything on my computer would be, uh, I'm a musician, I'm a drummer. So I've been watching a lot of the Rush uh, documentaries and Neil Peart and some of the stuff that he's done is just incredible. So for all those Rush fans out there. And so I just, I watch three or four of his drum solos at night and I, I just visualize and I, I, that's, that's more my entertainment. And then I'll come downstairs in, in the day and I'll just bang away on my drum set. So that, awesome. that's my big entertainment for the day awesome yeah great well thank you so much for all of you for coming on this was a fantastic talk i really enjoyed it hope everybody watching uh enjoyed it as well and um just want to tell you all have a great week well, thank you thank you guys for oh. watching that was Raph, so what are you watching yeah what am i watching uh we're on season eight of homeland right now we're sort of finishing that off and uh we just got into schitt's creek so we're on season two of that, which is hilarious. I've heard good things. We watch that next. Watch that. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry. I'm taking everything back. Watch Shit's Creek if you guys haven't seen Shit's yeah. Creek. Oh my God. <laughs> Shit's <laughs> Creek. There we go. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. See ya. Thanks. See ya. Oh, Same. feel free to reach out if you ever have questions. Yeah. Same. I'll I'll post uh, everybody's details on Instagram and Facebook.
Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.